got bills to pay, tax men on my tail. Just keep praying that checks in the mail. There are times it seems everything's lost, and I'm alone and I'm tossed. Then I see between the river and the ravens, I'm fed. Between oblivion. Father, give me faith, providence and grace. Between the river and the ravens, I'm fed. Sweet deliver, you lift up my head. Lead me in your way. I've grown sick and tired, trying to stand still. Learn to let the wind blow me where it will. Throw myself into the will of the way. How can we ever be brave till we're free? Between the river and the ravens, I'm fed. Between the blizzards. Father, give me faith, providence and grace. Between the river and the ravens, I'm fed. Sweet deliver, you lift up my head. Lead me in your way. There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way To prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore We shall sing on that beautiful shore The melodious songs of the blessed and our spirit shall sorrow no more 
Not a sigh for the blessing of rest In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful Father above We will offer our tribute of praise For the glorious gift of His love And His blessings that hallow our days And in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore Flames roar on Bathing their robes in red And not a burn was found On the three men left unseen They kept the faith Two fish and five loaves of bread Don't go, come sit down And every soul was fed
Um, the other thing that we, we need are scripture readers. Janice Cable has graciously agreed to do it, but she's going to be out of town a couple of times. So let Pastor know if you're willing to read scripture. Now, as we prepare to worship, please stand as you are able, and let's praise our God in song and music. Good morning, church. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. I'm happy to be here. Feels good. Feels right. Amen, Brother Jack. God's good. And I love to sing songs to my Lord and Savior because He is worthy. Amen.
wants to see each other. And I said, you know, it's a win-win. If I'm not here this morning, I'm in the presence of Almighty. So it's a win-win. Amen? Amen. Yeah. God is good. All the time. All the time, God is good. He's a good, good father. Amen? Amen.
What is your question? Was it what? The angel? It was. It was either Gabriel or Michael. One or the other. The Bible's not real clear on that. All we know is it was an angel that God sent down. You know what? It could have been Jesus too, because Jesus at one time was an angel. Ah, food for thought. Food for thought. So let's pray. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for helping me grow stronger in faith every day. Amen. Y'all ready to sing? Let's, let's not sing. Let's sing the next play. So what we're going to do now, you going to make me sing after all? Okay. <laughs> I was hoping not. <laughs> all right, let's, 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 uh, uh, let's sing. All right? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Y'all just run on back there to Robert. He's got he's got suckers. Well, he's got buckets too. So, all right. <laughs> While our children are getting ready to go around for the noisy collection, if you look, let me draw your attention to your handout. Look down there where it says small talk, noisy collection, and then centering song. Okay, the centering song, Mike and the band is going to play a great centering song, but when they get done. They're going to uh, just continue to play music because this is going to be a time I'm going to start a prayer and I'm going to pray what's on my heart, but then I'm going to turn it over to you, okay? I'm going to turn it over to you and you're going to pray. And we're all going to pray at the same time. We're going to pray for whatever's on our hearts, whatever the Holy Spirit leads us to pray, and we're going to go and pray as long as the last person stops. Amen? It's something different. Don't feel compelled to pray, but you don't have to pray out. You can pray softly. Yes. Let's pray to God as we get ready to do this. Amen? Amen. All right. So let us stand. Y'all ready? Let us stand and center ourselves to open our minds and our hearts so we can continue to worship God.
we pray that you breathe into us the Spirit of God. We pray that you bring your healing hands of mercy around us, Father. We are broken. We need you. We need you to heal us. Father, what perfect season is this in the season of Easter? When we come to you, when we kneel to you, when we bow to you, when we give ourselves to you and replace what of this world is within us with something that you have for us. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit comes to life to each and every one here today and they bring their prayers to you. Brothers and sisters, you can sit, you can stand this time in here, and we will go as long as the Spirit leads us in this prayer. For your Father, as we come back together, let us lift these prayers that you have given us to the only one who can make this possible, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Today's scripture is John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Thanks be to God. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. God. It's flipped. <laughs> it's okay. We're, we're all here together. The word of God. It's it's Now, I gotta kind of be honest with y'all. Uh, I wrote this this morning, about ten minutes before I went over to the first service. So bear with me, just give me a little leeway. It's been a real busy, busy week. Uh, what it is? It's the high cost of following the Christ and why Easter matters. What I'm doing is I'm starting this little sermon series on why Easter matters. And I always start off with a little question. One thing that baffles non-Christians about Christians is how often we Christians resist the very God that we say that we trust. One thing that baffles non-Christians is us Christians, how often we resist the way God, or the way that God says that we trust Him. You know, if you look at this and you're honest, if you're a Christian, you probably say at some point in your life that you had an internal battle with God. Amen? I mean, we've all had these internal battles with God. Maybe one of those battles is going on today. But have you ever really sat down and found yourself resisting God? The very God that you say you trust. I know I have, and we all have at some point in our life. Maybe... Maybe what it is is we know that we should forgive someone that we've wronged, that we've talked about. But, you know, forgiveness is one of, those th one of those things that's very hard. It's very hard to do. Catch me one day and I'll tell you about how I had to ask forgiveness from several people who thought I had done something to them. Or maybe, maybe we're in an unhealthy relationship that we know we need to get out of. It's a... Maybe it's because that relationship that's unhealthy is fascinating, to say the least, or maybe it's just a little bit addictive. 
You know, like, like we just can't part with it. We can't, we can't make ourselves leave it. Or maybe, maybe we go to certain places, places we know that we shouldn't go, but we go there because we're afraid we're missing out. <coughs> or my favorite is possibly we spend money irresponsibly. We should be more generous with what we have, but that temptation to indulge ourselves is just too irresistible. One thing I've learned is your conscience always tells you what is right. Your conscience will always tell you what's right. Scripture will always tell you what's right. You're trying to follow Jesus. You're trying to be what I call a Jesus follower, but you just want to do what you want to do. In other words, you find yourself resisting the God you trust. We want to follow Jesus, but we want to do what we want to do. It's an ongoing struggle. Even non-Christians understand that uh, this battle. Every person, believer or non-believer, knows what it's like to wrestle with their conscience. It's all part of being human. It's who we are. It's how we're wired. We apply standards to our lives that we know that we're never going to live up to. We apply standards to our lives that everything outside of this world tells us, well, you need that, or you need to live this way, or you need to be doing things this way. We know we can't ever live up to them, and so we wind up resisting God. Well, during this season of, season of Lent, this Easter season, we're going to look at several people whose lives intersect with Jesus, with his life. We're going to look at these lives in the weeks that's leading up to his crucifixion. And each one of them, each one of these people we're going to look at over the next few weeks has an agenda. It has an agenda that puts him with odds or at odds with God and with Jesus. And as we see it, there's a little bit of each one of them in us. A little bit of each one of these people in us as well. But here's what's really interesting about this whole thing. Their stories, their stories of resistance, Ill, resistance illustrates the futility of resisting God. And as lifelong Christians, our stories, our stories of resistance are also illustrated in the futility of of resisting God. And that's why I call this sermon series Easter Matters. Well, the first character we're going to talk to today in the study is about Joseph Caiaphas. Now, you may know Joseph uh, Caiaphas simply as uh, Caiaphas. He's in the book of John. You're going to read about him soon. He was a high priest during the time of Jesus. When Jesus made his, or was in his ministry, he is the high priest. And he's one of the most powerful, the most influential people in all of Jerusalem and all of Judea. You might say that Caiaphas himself was the connecting point between the nation of Israel and the Roman Empire. He was the man who communicated with Pilate and all the other leaders of the Roman Empire. Even more importantly, though, Caiaphas was part of a family that controlled the temple for over 40 years. Controlled the temple over 40 years. His father-in-law and uh, his five brother-in-laws were also high priests. They all had this enormous power over the people, and they were able to use that power to influence the people. And there's another perk to that. Each one of them were, was extremely wealthy. You see, these perks, these financial perks, went with being the epic center of the Jewish religion in the first century of Israel. Because every Jew, no matter where they were, every Jew all over the world, no matter where they were, had to pay a temple tax. And that tax went to support the daily operations. It went to support the upkeep of the building uh, of, of the temple in Jerusalem. And it went to pay the priest and the high priest. That's how they made their money. You see, for Caiaphas, then life was pretty good. Life was pretty good until... A very simple carpenter turned rabbi steps into the pages of history and changed everything. Let me give you a quick rundown. Everywhere Jesus went, hundreds and even thousands of people followed him. Their crowds grew and grew to enormous size. And not only was there a threat to Rome, but to the Jewish religious leaders as well. Because, you see, crowds made the Roman Empire nervous. Crowds made them nervous because in their mind, crowds tended to lead to division 
and insurrection, and they wanted nothing of that because it was easier to control somebody if they didn't try to rise above themselves and start all this division and insurrection. Crowds made the Romans necessary. And one, one thing that the Roman Empire expected of Caiaphas was to control his people. In other words, to maintain peace by keeping his own people under control. All he had to do. All he had to do. You see, there was another problem. There was another problem for Joseph, uh, for Jesus. There was another problem Jesus posed to Caiaphas. When Jesus spoke, he spoke with authority. People were amazed at the way he talked. He spoke with an authority, and he believed what he was saying. He had extraordinary confidence in everything that he said, and that made the critical. Uh, that made him very critical to the religious leaders. Because of the corruption inside the temple system, Jesus took the temple leaders to task. If you turn to Matthew 23, we see some ex uh, starting examples of the, compassion, of the compassionate criticism that Jesus laid out of the system that had grown to exploit the very people he was meant to serve. Jesus goes on and talks about the hypocrisy of religious or religion lead, or religious leaders. They, he called them snakes. He called them a brood of vipers. Now this was very harsh words because he condemned them to hell. Harsh words for those times. You, you snakes, you brood of, of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? No wonder that Caiaphas had a problem with Jesus' authority at this time. The crowd that he drew and the criticism of everyone that Caiaphas worked with and respected. Jesus put them down. Jesus not only threatened the peace of Jerusalem, but he also threatened the peacekeepers. He challenges the very foundation of Caiaphas' power and wealth, challenging everything about it. But the final straw, the final straw between Jesus and Caiaphas wasn't something that Jesus said, but something he did. It was an act of compassion. In John 12, 9, it says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus not only from the dead, but raised him from the dead after four days. See, that's unheard of. Normally, nothing happens within those three days because the person who's dead stays dead. And sometimes, you know, they bury them in these tombs. They may not, you know, they didn't know how to check pulses or anything like that. They may have epilepsy or whatever, you know, just fallen down, passed out, had a concussion. So they buried them. And it happened a lot of times people would, you know, just wake up from whatever their ailment was at, in, in, within those three days. But you see, Jesus waited till four days, four days before he raised him from the dead. So after he was dead, he was buried, and the people of his hometown in Bethany, well, they all attended the funeral. And so they all knew that he was dead. So when Lazarus came back to life and was walking around again, the crowd around Jesus swelled to these unprecedented sizes. And so Caiaphas soon realized that his plan to publicly humiliate or discredit Jesus wasn't working at all. He and the other religious leaders, what they did they had worked hard at trying to trick Jesus to force him to either blasphemy against God or to threaten the Roman Empire. But Jesus, Jesus outsmarted all of them because he wasn't evasive when he answered the questions. Jesus gave them the answer that they wanted. wasn't evasive at all. And he wasn't very good at playing political games, but because Jesus rejected the assumption at the core of the religious leaders' questions is how he got around this. When they ask him, for example, where should people pay taxes? Should people pay, uh, when, when they ask him if people should pay taxes to Rome or give money to God, Jesus' response was, give back to Caesar to what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's. That was his response. Jesus was saying that money played a much less significant role in God's kingdom than the religious leaders led everyone to believe. You see, folks in that day and age had to buy an animal, a dove, uh, a goat, or a calf, or a lamb. 
and pay the temple to sacrifice that to become clean. Because that was what they were saying. That all this money, this is the only way you're going to get to God is go out and spend this money and then pay us to sacrifice it because it had to be sacrificed on the temple steps. But when Jesus pointed it out, saying God's kingdom isn't all about that, and that the religious leaders had their priorities all wrong. Jesus then raised Lazarus from the dead. And Caiaphas realized that the little traps that they were sitting for Christ wasn't going to work anymore. If you turn to the Gospel of John 11, 47 to 50, 50, we learn that then the chief priest and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Now the Sanhedrin was another group of religious leaders. What are we... What are we accomplishing? Or what are we accomplishing? They asked. Here's a man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man dies for the people than the whole nation perishes. Tell you right here that they're setting up to crucify Jesus. The big worry of the religious leaders was, was that everyone would start to believe in Jesus and believe in Jesus in their hearts of hearts. And they knew that to resist Jesus was to resist God. But following Jesus would have to require them. See, if they were to follow Jesus, the religious leaders, it would require them to let go of something that was very important to them. Something that they built their entire lives around. That would be the religious system. The religious system rewarded and protected the priest. It defined who the priests were, were. And Jesus was about to bring all that to a change. In John 11, or John it says, if we don't do something, they thought, we're going to lose everything that is important to us. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. When we decide to follow Jesus, I'm not going to make any bones about this. When we decide to follow Jesus, it's going to cost something. It's going to cost you something. In fact, as a Christian, every single time you decide to put Jesus front and center in your life, it costs you something. It costs you something of this world. This is the reason that some resist church for so long. They don't want to give something up because they know by following Jesus, they have to lose something of themselves. Eventually, Caiaphas begged Jesus with the charge of sedation against the Roman Empire and had him crucified. And so at that point, he thought that the threat was eliminated. His position in the nation, he thought, was secure. And then just as the sun rose on the first day of the week after Passover, there was a commotion in the street. The body of Jesus was missing. The body of Jesus was missing. And a few days after that came reports of Jesus sighting all over the place. A few weeks after that, Jesus, uh, his closest followers, came out of hiding and into the streets saying that you crucified Jesus. God raised him from the dead and we had seen him. So you need to owe us an apology. Suddenly, the crowds of people rallying around the name, the reputation, and the resurrection of Jesus. There was crowds saying, He is risen, He is the risen Lord, and He is the true Messiah. And it began to draw on Caiaphas that Jesus had accomplished more by dying on the cross than He had during His entire lifetime. Amen? Amen. Years later, years later, Joseph Caiaphas became a footnote in the history of Jesus of Nazareth. A simple footnote in the history. See, Caiaphas lost his position of leadership. The Jewish people lost their temple, torn down by the emperor Titus. So those who stood against the will of God also became footprints in the story of Jesus. And I know what you're asking, because they asked me this earlier. What does all this have to do with me? What does all this have to do with us sitting here? Everything. Everything in the world. Because you see, there's a little bit of Caiaphas in every one of us here today. 
There's something inside of us that wants to preserve the things the way they are at all costs. You see, we want God to either help us or we want God to get out of the way. We want Him to help us or we want Him to get out of the way. There is no way we can do it together. But Easter, Easter is a warning against that impulse of having God get out of the way. It's a warning that God doesn't compromise. He doesn't compromise. There's, there are those who try to stand against Him, and they will become footnotes as well. And so this first week of Lent, this first week of Lent, I want you to look at what you have put in the center of your life. What have you put in the center? Is it a position at work? Is it a grade point average for our students? Is it that unhealthy relationship? Is it money? Is it power? Is it pride? What have you put at the center of your life that has replaced God? That little voice inside is desperate to preserve whatever it is because that is what's standing between you and your Heavenly Father. Whatever it is that we replace God with is always going to be less than God. Whatever we replace God with is always going to be that. It's going to be less than God. It's already diminishing in value. It's already diminishing in its significance. Think about it. Think about it. Your greatest regrets, your greatest regrets are connected to attempts to preserve something or someone that, even, that isn't even a part of your life anymore. Don't let something that doesn't even matter in the long run act as that little G. We call those little Gs those little gods. You see, these little gods always disappoint. They always disappoint. God does not. God has a plan. And to put anything other than Him at the center of your life is nothing less than self-destructive. So I ask you again, what are you trying to preserve that you need to surrender to God? The song that Mike and them sang, the band, was a great song, I Surrender. What are you trying to preserve that you need to surrender to? What is that little God in your life demanding more and more and providing less and less? Friends, saying yes to God is going to cost you something. Saying yes to God will cost you something, but saying no will cost you more, including what you replace God with. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> As we conclude worship and come to you to the table, we ask that you breathe your spirit into us so that we can replace what we have preserved in our life. We can replace and take out. We want to take out what the world has told us to do and replace it with something that you have for us. Help us to recognize that. Help us to see that. In Jesus we pray. Amen. As we prepare for our offering, let us come up. Most gracious Father, we ask that you accept these gifts, this fragrant offering, so that we may return to what to you, to what you have given us. church to worship God we hear God's word 
then we come to this table. For our guest today, we have a table set by God's hand, and it's open to all. You don't need to be a member of this church. You don't need to be a member of any faith tradition. You don't need to be a member of any denomination. But this table is set by God's hand. We say words over it, but yet it is for God's children. And so today I ask, as we take the loaf of bread and we raise it to the heavens and we bless it and give thanks, Jesus broke it and said, this is my body given to you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. Jesus was soon, after the supper, he took a cup and he raised it and he gave thanks and he said, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant shed for you, for many, for the sins, the forgiveness of the sins of the world. Take, drink, and as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. What better way to respond to God's grace that he's offered us? What better way to respond to God's call as we come to take communion with God himself? Again, the table is open to all our guests. You do not have to be a member. You just have to have a heart that you're searching for something more, that you're searching for God that loves you, that has asked you to be here today. You see, we call this convenient grace as we walk through those doors and you've never graced a, a church before. That is God's grace reaching out to you. Because when we do this, it connects us back to Him. Amen. Our table is set. Will those helping with communion please come up?
grace towards us. Our sins are forgiven by simple asking for them. Father, we pray that by sharing communion with you today, it will start us on our path, our journey, being sanctified. To walking a better life with you. To living a better life by letting you lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would y'all please stand and uh, sing one last song with us as we get ready to close out our worship. Amen.
open day, you are made new. Leave whatever you have in your heart of this world here today, in this room, and take the love of God and what He offers with you. Go from here with His blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Soon we'll come to the end of life's journey And perhaps we'll never meet anymore Till we gather in heaven's bright city Far away on that beautiful shore If we never meet again the sight of heaven as we struggle through this world and its strife There's another meeting place somewhere in heaven By the side of the river of life Where the roses bloom forever And where separation comes no more if we never meet again this side of heaven I will meet you on that beautiful shore Oh, they say we shall meet by the river Where no storm clouds ever darken the sky And they say we'll be happy in heaven in that wonderful sweet by and by If we never meet again this side of heaven As we struggle through this world and its strife There's another meeting place somewhere in heaven By the side of the river of life where the roses bloom forever And where separation comes no more If we never meet again the side of heaven I will meet you on that beautiful shore Staring down at me Said I'll take my share now Father, please and You took your money And you took your leave You took my heart and turned your back on me And you hit the town Open doors have shut And your heart 
hungry stomachs tied in knots But I know what you're thinking That you troubled me enough Nothing could ever separate you from my love I still stand to you I have heard of a land on a far away strand. Tis a beautiful home of the soul. Built by Jesus on high, where we never shall die. Tis a land where we'll never grow. never grow old where we'll never grow old in a land where we'll never grow old never grow old where we'll never grow old in a land where we'll never grow old In that beautiful home Where we'll never more roam We shall be in that sweet by and by Happy praise to the King Through eternity ring Tis a land where we never shall die Never grow old where we'll never grow old. Tis a land where we'll never grow old. Never grow old where we'll never grow old. Tis a land where we'll never grow old. When our work here is done And our life's crown is won And our troubles and trials are o'er All our sorrow will end And our voices will blend With the loved ones who've gone on before Never grow old where we'll never grow old in a land where we'll never grow old never grow old where we'll never grow old in a land where we'll never grow old never grow old where we'll never grow old there's a land where we'll never grow old Never grow old Where we'll never grow old Tis a land where we'll never grow old 